Great. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. My name is Andrea Barton Reeves, and I am the CEO of the Connecticut's Paid Leave Authority. So I'm delighted and thank you for the opportunity to present to you. And today with me, I have um, our executive assistant, Amber Forrest. And Amber and I will be facilitating the presentation. And Amber has just a few words for us with respect to housekeeping, and then I'll get started. Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. So today I'd like to ask that you use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to submit your questions. By using the Q&A feature, all of the other participants in the group will be able to see that question and the answer that goes along with it so that other people that may have the same questions as you uh, can get that question answered as well. In the meantime, I'll be using the chat to drop links to our website, um, our next webinars, our calendar of events, and other tools that'll be very useful to you coming up in the future. Thank you so much. Andrea, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Great, thank you, Amber. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And Amber, if you would let me know if you can see it when, I'm, when I do that, just give me a minute to get there. Okay. Can you see All my right. screen? Amber, yes, we're good? We okay, thank you. Just had a couple of things that keep popping up. Uh -oh. Controls. All right, we're going to go to the beginning. All right. Now we'll go to the beginning. And I love technology. Here we go. Okay, great. All right, so today we'll talk about the basics of paid leave. This is a more comprehensive presentation than just the basics. It will actually give you some examples of how the paid leave law would apply under certain circumstances. So let's go ahead and get started. As I mentioned before, I'm Andrea Barton Reeves. I am the CEO of the Paid Leave Authority. I was most recently the president and CEO of HARC which supports people with intellectual disabilities and their families. I have an undergraduate degree in English from Rutgers and I have a law degree from the New York Law School. Today we'll have an overview of the pay leave program, review some key dates, an overview of the law itself, some direction on how employees will apply for pay leave benefits and the role of employers. As I mentioned earlier, putting it into practice with a few practical examples, some places where you can find additional resources and then questions and answers. The authority is one that was actually brought into existence through a statute that was signed by Governor Lamont in 2019. Our purpose is to serve the growing need and, fa and for families to provide financial relief when they need to take time off to care for themselves or a loved one without having to worry about whether they won't have any income in their households. We have a twofold mission. One is to provide pathways to accessible paid leave benefits, and the other is to help employers and administrators and healthcare professionals by providing them tools and support so that they can navigate the program as well. We have five primary responsibilities at the Paid Leave Authority. One of them is outreach and engagement. So again, we're really delighted to be here today to do that. We develop the policies and the procedures that are needed to run the program. We also establish the contribution rate, which is set by statute at no more than one half of 1%. We approve and audit private plans, which employers can offer as an alternative to the public plan. And we administer claims for paid leave benefits. So who is covered by the statute and has to participate in the plan? Employers who have one or more people working in the state, including not-for-profit organizations and private, sectors, empl private sector employers with unionized workforces. So just a bit of clarification here. If you are a private sector employer with a unionized workforce, your union is not voting as to whether or not they can participate in the plan. They do participate in the plan. Their only vote is whether or not if you as an employer offer a private plan as an alternative, they can determine whether they participate in the private or the public, but participation is mandatory. Sole proprietors and self-employed people are also eligible to participate. They have the option and it is solely voluntary on their part. If they choose to do so, the statute says that they have to remain in for a minimum of three years. 
The categories of workers who are not covered include those that work in the federal government and those that work for the state of Connecticut with some exceptions, and those are covered public employees. Municipalities and local or regional boards of education are also exempted with the exception of their covered public employees, which essentially are those that are in unions. But the only category of employer that is completely exempt from the law are non-public elementary or secondary schools. What exactly is a covered public employee? They are a non-unionized employee of the state of Connecticut. So that's the managerial non-unionized employees of the state. Unionized employees who collectively bargain to participate in the program. With respect to municipalities and local or regional boards of education, if the union decides for either the municipality or the local or regional board of ed that they choose to participate in the plan, public or private, then the entirety of that workforce, rather whether they are in the union or not, are then participating in the paid leave program. Municipalities has a very broad definition, which is why we take the time to outline it here. And you can see it runs from the traditional definition of a town, city, borough to a tourism district and a flood commission. So it's a very wide swath of municipalities, the definition of municipalities that would be applicable to the statute. So what happens to the one half of 1% that will start to be collected in January? The employee will contribute the one half of 1% of wages that's collected by the employer. The employer then remits those contributions and wage information so that we can reconcile the contribution with the amount of wages. We receive that at the pay leave authority and we validate that information. Those contributions are deposited directly into the pay leave trust fund, which is managed by the office of the treasurer. And that trust fund is used to administer the program and pay paid leave benefits. Here are some key dates that are important, we think, for employers to know. The website, ctpayleave.org, launched in September. It does have an abundance of information that's available to you and materials that can be downloaded to share with your employees. Registration for the paid leave program is open now. And we're asking all employers to please register by December 31st so that we know, that you know, that withholding starts on January 1 of 2021 and benefits then become available in January of 2022. So now a brief overview of the leave laws. Here are the reasons for leave as outlined in the statute. Leave is available to create or expand your family through the birth of a child or to create your family through adoption or foster care, to care for a family member with a serious health condition or to care for your own serious health condition, which could include but is not limited to serving as an organ or bone marrow donor or pregnancy for which an additional two weeks might be available if there's incapacitation due to pregnancy. Special leave is available for family members to care for another family member who had been injured during active duty. And there's also qualifying exigency leave available for family members to see another off who is in the military and is called up to active duty overseas. Finally, what is unique to Connecticut's law is that there's, there are 12 days of the 12 weeks that are available for leave for those who are impacted by family violence. Now here's a comparison between the current Family and Medical Leave Act in our state that will be effective through all of next year and the act as it will look in 2022. Right now, the law applies to employers that have 75 employees or more. And for employees to access leave benefits, they had to have worked for their employer for at least 12 months and 1,000 hours. And then job protection would have been available after 12 months. Once those criteria were met, 16 weeks of leave and a 24 month period would be available to the employee. And the employer could require the employee to use all of their accrued time to cover any or part or all of the time that they were off for family and medical leave. Starting in 2022, the law changes significantly. 
As I noted earlier, it applies to employers with one or more employees as opposed to the 75 employee threshold that exists now. There will be no hours worked requirement and job protection, meaning the ability to get your job back when you return from leave will be available after three months rather than 12. There'll be 12 months, there'll be 12 weeks of leave available in a 12 month period for all of the reasons I noted earlier with the additional two weeks for the pregnancy leave if needed. And most important is that employers will no longer be permitted to have an employee exhaust all of their time off to cover their family leave time. They must allow an employee to keep up to two weeks of their accrued leave, PTO or vacation when they use their time for family and medical leave. So here's a brief overview of the job protected leaves that exist in the state. We have federal leave, which will continue to exist and uh, has similar qualifications as our current state leave. We still have our Connecticut FMLA, which I just outlined, and the new one, which I also just spoke to. Workers' Compensation, the Americans with Disabilities Act, the Pregnancy Disabilities Act, and the Connecticut Fair Employment Practices Act will still remain as active laws that offer some form of either reasonable accommodation or job protected leave. The laws that would provide for income replacement will be the Paid Leave Act, come 1-1-2022, and workers' compensation will remain active as well. The primary difference between the reasons for leave between the federal and our current Connecticut law is the expanded definition of a family member. So when the law goes into effect in 2022, an employee will be able to take time off and receive leave paid leave benefits so that they may care for a parent, a spouse, a son or a daughter of any age as compared to the federal FMLA, which caps that at 18, a sibling, a grandparent, a grandchild, or an individual related to the employee either by blood or affinity where they can demonstrate that there's a close association between that employee and that person that is the equivalent of a family relationship. So an example of that might be a foster sibling with whom the person was raised during their childhood. Or another example would be an aunt or uncle that had been a close family friend for that person's, excuse me, entire life. And now that person perhaps has no family, needs someone to care for them. That would be some examples of the close affiliation that would be equivalent of family relationships. Uh, here is more uh, information on that with respect to a proposed definition that has actually now been adopted by our board. The specific definition is any person with whom the employee has a significant personal bond that is like a family relationship, regardless of their biological or legal relationship. And this is determined by situation and not necessarily by statute. So I'll go to the next to the last bullet as an example of an unmarried significant other of the employee with whom the employee maintains a familial spouse-like relationship despite their lack of a legal relationship to one another. That would be an example of related by affinity. So then let's move on to what the length of the leave might be. As I spoke earlier, federal leave remains in place and that gives people access to 12 weeks of leave in a 12 month period, except for the military leave, for which 26 weeks of leave might be available. In 2022, Connecticut's job protected leave is essentially 12 weeks under most circumstances in a 12 month period. Again, an exception for military caregiver leave, 12 days for family violence, and two weeks perhaps for any incapacitation due to pregnancy those same leave times apply to the paid leave benefits as well. Eligibility for these leaves looks like this. There is still an hour's work and a time work with the employer requirement for federal leave. But with the new leave for family and medical leave in Connecticut, as I noted earlier, it's only three months for child protective leave and there is no hours worked requirement any longer. To get access to paid leave benefits from the Paid Leave Authority, the person would have had to have earned at least $2,325 in the highest earning quarter of the first four of the past five quarters in which they've worked immediately preceding the time that they applied for leave. In addition, they had to have been working in the state or they had been working 
in the 12, in the past 12 weeks, immediately preceding the time that they want to access their leave, or they have to be a sole proprietor or a self-employed individual who has opted to participate in the program. Let's just talk a little bit about claims administration. So what do employees do to access paid leave benefits from the paid leave authority? They apply for those benefits to the authority. And let me just stop here for a moment. This happens after the employee has had an opportunity to apply to the employer for their paid leave. Let me even say that more precisely. This happens after the employee has applied to the employer for leave period. Then the employer will make a determination as to whether or not that leave has any income replacement or whether the person can access any part of their accrued leave for income replacement. And I'll go into that a bit more in a minute. But once all of that has been determined, the employee then comes to the paid leave authority for their benefits. We then validate whether or not they in fact have eligibility based on their earnings from all Connecticut employers, because that 2325 can be earned by a from a number of employers. And we also validate the reason why the employee is seeking benefits, because it has to be one of the ones that are covered by the statute. We calculate their benefit amount. We communicate to the employer so that we can validate to the employee and to the employer that there is awareness of those covered absences and to determine if there are any other benefits that that employee has that may offset the benefits that we're paying. And once that's done, then there's an issuance of paid leave benefits. So the formula for paid leave is uh, a bit complex. So I'll try to, to explain it as best I can. Essentially, it's in two parts. So if a person is earning less than or equal to the minimum wage multiplied by 40, which right now is $480, then they're eligible to receive about 90, up to 95% of their base weekly earnings. If they earn more than that 480, which is the 40 times the $12 an hour, then their benefits come in two parts. They get the 480 plus 60% of the amount of their base weekly earnings that exceeds the 480 multiplied by 40. And, but that whole number is capped at 60 times the minimum wage under every circumstance. So if you're doing the math, you're right that the more you earn, the, the smaller your benefit amount is as compared to those who earn either less than or equivalent to the minimum wage. And the reason is this, that the idea behind the program is to provide some form of income and wage replacement, but not to provide full wage replacement because there, there isn't really any program in the country that provides full wage replacement at every wage level. So the role of the employer, when an employee comes to you and requests leave, as I mentioned that they would do earlier, there are really two questions that should be asked each time. And that's whether or not that employee is eligible for any type of job protected leave under one or more of the statutes and whether when they take that leave, if they're eligible for any income replacement. And it's really important to ask both of these questions each time. Because as we mentioned earlier, they may be eligible for federal FMLA, state FMLA, both which can run concurrently, neither, but perhaps a job protected leave as a reasonable accommodation, such as the Americans with Disabilities Act or the Pregnancy Disabilities Act, or no job protected leave at all. This slide is just a brief reminder of the types of job protected leave that are available under federal and state. And those that I mentioned just before about the ADA and the Pregnancy Disabilities Act. Income replacement men might then be available once you determine whether or not they are eligible for any kind of job protected leave. And again, employees can come to the, to the paid leave authority and receive those benefits in addition to any employer provided benefits, as long as those added together do not exceed 100% of the employee's regular wages. There are times when uh, an employer's short-term and long-term disability policies dictate that the employee must exhaust their state benefits first. And in those instances, they would come to the paid leave authority and once those are exhausted, then they, may, they might avail themselves of any benefits available through their employer. Under no circumstances, though, is an individual who's receiving workers' compensation benefits 
uh, are is are eligible or is eligible for paid leave benefits from the paid leave authority. Employees may be required to use their sick leave, their vacation time, or their other PTO. But just a reminder that in 2022, they are entitled to keep up to two weeks of their leave. If you as an employer actually offer leave in different buckets, meaning say sick vacation and let's say personal leave, you can, you can require the person to exhaust all of their sick leave, but you cannot require them to exhaust their sick and then their vacation. If you offer PTO as the sole source of accruals for leave, then you must allow the person to keep two weeks of their PTO. If they have less than that, you can't require them to use any of it. Okay, it's essentially, uh, we just, so let's just go into practice. Uh, how, this, how would this work? Well, so we have uh, a large company, Acme Industries, and they have 100 employees that work in the state. We have Wiley Coyote, who we know is a full-time employee and he's worked with Acme for 10 years. So he absolutely has job protection. He has four weeks of sick leave and two weeks of vacation time. He's injured his, his hand in, a, in his off-duty, non-work-related fireworks activities, and now he needs to be out of work for eight weeks. The questions we ask ourselves is that are the twofold, uh, is applying the twofold analysis. Is he eligible for any kind of job protected leave? And whether or not he's eligible for job replacement, for, I'm sorry, for income replacement. So you can see here that in 2022, he in fact has job protected leave because he's worked for the company for well over 10 years. So he's well within the three month job protection period. He's also eligible for federal leave for the same reason because he's worked well over a year and the 1,250 hours. Under Connecticut FMLA, he can be required to exhaust his sick leave accruals, as you can see for the four weeks through February. And then his wage replacement benefits for the remaining four weeks would come from the paid leave authority. Here's someone who has a different scenario. So Jamie works for a smaller employer she works part-time and she's worked for two years. She too has worked long enough to have the job protection under the new law, but she only has six, six days of six, three weeks of vacation time. And she, run, she breaks her leg running with her dog. So again, we ask, does she have job protected leave? And what is her eligibility for income replacement? So here you see, she's got job protected leave. She is required to use her sick leave and a bit of her vacation, but it's not required. And that's why her sick leave accrual is in red and her vacation is in the yellow. Because she can use it if she wants to, but she's, she is entitled to keep her two weeks. And then she can get wage replacement for the remainder of the time that she's out on leave. For those of you who have spouses working for you in the same employer, the federal leave law and the state leave law require those spouses to share their 12 week job protection leave to bond with a child that is new to their family through birth adoption or foster care, or to care for a family member with a serious health condition. Come uh, in 2022, the spouses will not be required to share their 12 week paid leave benefit. So let me just clarify this a bit, that the statute does require them to share their time for their newborn or their child that's due to their family, but if they themselves are entitled to a 12 week paid leave benefit, they are not required to share that. Let's talk a little bit about the private plans. I mentioned that employers can offer this as an alternative to the public plan, but there are some criteria that apply to that. The, that plan has to offer the same or better benefits as the public plan, and it can't cost employees any more in contributions than the one half of 1% or any amount that the public plan charges. So if, for example, the public plan has enough reserves to lower the contribution rate, then private plans must do the same. Those plans also have to demonstrate the ability to administer the claims and benefits. And the statute requires that employees be given the opportunity to vote to approve the, the private plan. And that vote has to be held with a majority vote of all of the eligible employees who work in the state. And finally, the pay leave authority approves the plan. So if you're interested in applying for a private plan, here's how that process works. Right now you will go in and register on ctpayleave.org and let us know 
whether or not you intend to, intend to apply, apply for a private plan. Then soon we will notify you to go back to the website and complete your application. Then after you have completed your application, you will then submit to us the final plan documents, which are three. One is a declaration from an insurer, and there are now 14. I believe now there are 15 insurers who have expressed an interest in offering this coverage in the state. Something that we're calling a plain language guide, which is a summary of the statute that we at the authority have provided so that you can give that to your employees to explain what the law is. And third is proof of your vote and the majority vote in favor of the private plan. I've covered a lot and everything that I've spoken of can be found on our website, ctpaidleave.org. Some of the information that's available to you as employers include an employee rights poster and an employee rack card, which is a large, a longer and then a shorter summary of all of the criteria and information that is relevant to paid family and medical leave. There is also what we call a paycheck mailer. This can be downloaded and emailed to all of your employees to let them know that deductions will, be get, will start in January 1 of 2021. This document, Employer Toolkit, 24-page toolkit, that includes everything I just spoke of today, including registration, private plans, the differences between the two laws, all of that. And we will share this presentation, so you'll have that as well. There's also a guide for employees that can be downloaded and a guide also for you as employers that's available separately or within the employer toolkit. So what, is, what are the immediate courses of action for you as an employer? We need you to register at ctpaidleave.org and please do so by December 31st. Then contact your payroll provider to be sure that they're prepared. We have been working with all of the major payroll providers and with Intuit, which owns QuickBooks, since April. So they should all be very well aware that this is coming. If you find that they are not, please let us know that at the Paid Leave Authority, and we will work on that with, the, with you and with them. Educate your employees about withholding using the information that I noted earlier that can be found on the website in the employer section of the site. And visit the site regularly for updates. And we're here to help you. You can go to the Contact Us portal, which is the preferable way because that way you'll get an answer pretty quickly. You can use this email address, but I'm really encouraging you to use the portal. And also to go to the site, which has frequently asked questions and helpful videos. And thank you. Okay. All right, I know I covered a lot. <laughs> oh, we're here to ask, answer whatever questions there might that people might have. All right, we don't currently have any questions in the Q&A. If anyone has any questions, would you please submit them to the Q&A? Because we'd like to make sure that we're able to answer as many of your questions as we possibly can. Sure. Okay. All right, so we have a question that says, so to clarify, can you please go over the reporting process? All right, so let me make sure I, I understand what the reporting process means. If it means that- For the employee, are, he specified. I'm sorry? He's, um, this is from Anthony and he's referring for the employee. So to clarify, can you please go over the reporting process for the employee? Okay, so the employee doesn't have really any reporting process directly with respect to this, the, the stage in which we're in now. When the employee is applying for paid leave benefits, their reporting requirement is this. They have to go to their primary care or when whoever their healthcare provider is and get a certification. And we will be providing those forms. That they will come to you with that certification that says, I have a serious health condition or I otherwise qualify for leave under the statute. Then after having reviewed that, it is an entitlement as this federal leave is now and, and family leave is now, then that person would then be entitled to take that leave. But the, that form has to tell you what they're taking the leave for, uh, who for whom they're providing leave if it's not for them, they're providing care, I should say, if it's not for them, and how long they will be away from work. If they then don't have enough time to cover the time that they're away, then they would come to the paid leave authority. 
We will then continue to be in touch with you, as I noted earlier, so that we can keep you up to date on how long they've made, but to let you know, first of all, they've come to apply for leave, and then how long they'll be away. Uh, so the, the employee doesn't really have a reporting requirement in any other respect under the statute right now. Thank you. Okay, the next question is coming from Ashley. I use QuickBooks for payroll. Will QuickBooks automatically make the deduction? So I'm not necessarily sure how QuickBooks will work. I can tell you though, that they, they have told us that they're issuing a, an update to QuickBooks software so that you can, in fact, withhold the one half of 1%. And so I don't know if that's going to be automatic or something that you'll have to implement, but it will be available. Great, the next question is from Robin. Our payroll company has told us they will sign us up for Connecticut paid leave. Do we still have to register ourselves? on CT pay leave. Okay, let me look at that, Cassandra, because you dropped out a little bit for a minute. So let me just see the question, um, so I can see. Oh, they will sign us up. Okay, yes. so some employer, some payroll companies have said to their customers, we will sign you up. So if they told you that, no, you don't have to register as well. If they're telling you, you need to register, then I would go ahead and do that because we wanna make sure that you are registered. Okay, great. And that concludes our questions for now. Does okay. anyone else have any questions? No. All right. It doesn't look right. like it. No, it doesn't. So well, thank you. Thank you, Susan, for having us this morning. If anyone has any other questions, please feel free to just contact Amber or me and just send them to us and we'll try to get you some answers as, as best we can. But we really appreciate the time to present this today. Thank you. We appreciate you being here right and Absolutely. early on the Tuesday morning. We it's appreciate okay. your information and your accessibility. It was, it's been great to work with you. Thank you very much. You're and, very welcome. Um, Everyone have a wonderful holiday season. Yes, Thank you, you too. You as well. Thank you, everyone. Thank you as well. Okay. Have a great day. Bye.